Hi, welcome back to The Sound Project. My name's Gavin Haverstick with Haverstick Designs. And I'm Ryan, and this is The Sound Project. Today, we're gonna cover basically speakers within a space. Placement of speakers and like size of speakers within a certain room is really, really important when it comes to acoustics. So first, let's talk about the relationship between the size of a speaker and the room that it's in. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing that we're always dealing with is um, uh, making sure that we're not overexciting the room when it comes mm -hmm. to that, because uh, small rooms struggle with low frequency performance. And the reason for that is, is that the wavelengths uh, of low frequencies are a lot of times longer than the dimensions of your room. Like mm -hmm. the, the wave doesn't even uh, have the ability to fully open up and develop before it's stunted by a boundary. And so sure. uh, kind of showing on this graph here, and I'm going to be showing some imaging uh, throughout this this podcast. And if you're listening to this on audio only, um, we it is live on YouTube as well. So, mm -hmm. so you can go back and check out what I'm looking at, but uh, what I'm showing here is a um, room that's 15 foot long and, uh, you know, typical nice size bedroom. It would be a 15 foot long space. But if we look at the wavelength for 40 hertz, it's actually 28 feet 3 inches is how long of a wavelength 40 hertz is. And a lot of uh, speakers are going to go down to that frequency. And, mm -hmm. and um, you're, you're trying to replicate a wave that's physically uh, almost twice as long as the, the length of your room, your, the longest dimension of your room. And so there is this equation here, uh, C is equal to F times lambda. Um, so this equation is, is easy to uh, use and it's able to uh, figure out the frequency or the wavelength if you know either one of those variables. Uh, C is the uh, speed of sound and you can use 1,130 feet per second. That's, that's going to be uh, good for this equation. And then the F represents the frequency, which would be in hertz. Mm -hmm. And then the lambda is the wavelength in feet. And so uh, it's just two variables and one constant. So if you know one of the variables, you can plug and play and, and figure out the other one. So, um, you know, for instance, if you plug in 80 hertz, you want to figure out how long 80 hertz is. Uh, it's 14.125 feet if you do the math. And so uh, what we're dealing with is, is a lot of low frequency energy uh, just can't be reproduced super well in a, in a small room. And so honestly, sometimes uh, it's it's better not to go with the, the huge woofers and, and uh, subwoofers and, and large speakers in a small room because you're exciting it and ca sometimes causing more problems than it's worth. Sure. Um, so sometimes a smaller speaker is just going to play well in, in a small space. Uh, ideally, if you had a, a really large room, you could go with whatever large format speakers you want. Um, but uh, sometimes smaller rooms require a little bit smaller speaker. Sure. So with that being said, after going through, you know, the sizing of the speaker compared to the size of the room. So then let's talk about the placement. So mm -hmm. how should you know where to place the speakers versus where to place your mix position? Absolutely. So this is really, really important. And uh, in, in some spaces, it's almost equally as important in how you treat the room uh, is, is where you place your speakers in your mix position because mm -hmm. uh, you can either set yourself up for success or set yourself up for a lot of headaches, uh, honestly. And uh, really when it comes to uh, speaker positioning, uh, one thing that we have to get right is the equilateral triangle. And you probably heard this before potentially, but the equilateral triangle, you want it to be equidistant between the tweeters of the speaker uh, and also your head. Um, however, one thing that, that people uh, often do is just think it's this point right in the center of your head. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually want that point of the equilateral triangle to be about a foot behind your head. Um, and the reason for that is, is that if you aim it at right at the point of your head, then all the sound is directed at your nose. And we don't hear with our nose, we hear with our ears. And so it's important to have that go past your ears uh, about a foot behind your head, and then the, the sound is going to arrive at your head the way that you want it to. Um, so here showing this graph, uh, or this, this diagram of a, um, a equilateral triangle, this one happens to be five foot on each uh, on each side of that equilateral triangle that can adjust and that's kind of part of the process and experimentation with with placing speakers uh, but you can see it's five foot on each side uh, the speakers are towed in so that it creates a 60 degree angle on each side of that that equilateral triangle and that peak of the point uh, of the, the the triangle is actually about a foot behind the the listener um, and and uh, we can change the size of that triangle. We can make it uh, longer or smaller. Sometimes you have large format speakers that are soffit mounted. You want to be further away from them. But for near fields, like having them in that you know four to six foot range is, is 
pretty common. Uh, sometimes it's even closer to that if you're setting your speakers on your actual desk. Sure. Uh, but this equilateral triangle is super important to make sure that you're you're receiving energy from the left and right speaker at the same time, uh, but also uh, it, you're, you're sitting right in that sweet spot to get the best sound possible. Then the other thing that we want to look at is where uh, you sit in the room. Um, yeah. And and there's uh, we're going to cover on a completely different episode um, uh, room modes and how that's going to impact your, your sound, especially in the low frequency range. Uh, but this is a good trick as far as where to start because there's so many places you could put your mix position in a room and it's like, it's kind of paralyzing. Like, well, what a, where, do, where do I even begin? And, sure. and there's this rule of thumb that, that uh, a lot of acousticians use where it's, it's uh, taking the length of the room and multiplying it by 0.38. So it's mm-hmm. taking 38% of the length of the room. And this works, I'd say, 95% of the time. If it's a rectangular space, this is where you end up be having the best best response. And so uh, you see this diagram here. I'm showing a top view of a room, and it shows the length there. And then uh, the mix position is placed at 0.38 times that length. So, for instance, if your room was 10 foot long, uh, you'd be 3.8 feet away from the front wall is where your head would be. Um, and then you kind of size your equilateral triangle and your speakers um, uh, on top of that. Um, the other thing that I want to look at here is um, if we look at our next graph, uh, th- this is a frequency response graph uh, of a room that didn't have any acoustical treatment. And I just had arrived on site and he actually had had his, his mix position pushed uh, right up against the front wall, uh, really, really close to the front wall. And it was ended up sitting at about the 25% point instead of this 38% point that we'd like to get to. So he's just closer to the front wall than we would have liked. Sure. And what I want to focus in on here is, uh, obviously there's a lot of peaks and dips in this frequency response. There was no treatment as untreated room. Uh, but if we look at this 48 hertz uh, peak that's happening, so right around here, uh, there's a peak of energy at 48 hertz. And uh, that is something where uh, it happened to relate to a front to back axial mode. And again, we'll, we'll cover modes again on a different, different podcast, but uh, it's sound was traveling front to back and canceling up and building up at, at different spots because of an axial mode. Mm-hmm. And it happened at 48 hertz here. And that blue line on this graph was the response when I first arrived. And I just put the microphone at the listening position that the, the client had already selected. Every line that you see as this kind of, you see it goes down to a, a uh, orange line, a purple line, um, or it's a red line, a purple line, an orange line, then a green line. All that is is me moving the, the mix position back six inches each time. And it, notice that it takes sometimes one to two decibels off of that peak to bring it back down more in line with, uh, if you look at the average in the low frequency range, it's maybe the, where this, this line I'm drawing is. Uh, before, it was about 6 dB above that line. Mm-hmm. And then just by moving things back, you were able to get that take control of that. Now, I will say with acoustical treatment, uh, that's going to be very difficult to handle because it's 48 hertz. It's, it's low in the frequency range. You're going to need really deep bass trapping or potentially even a tuned device in order to address that. And this was able to be remedied just by experimentation and testing. Sure. And so that's one thing I will tell people is that when it comes to speaker positioning, you really need to experiment with uh, your location of both your, your uh, mix position and your, your speaker locations because it can make all the difference in the world when it comes to your frequency response. And it's better to start off on the right foot even before acoustical treatment because it's gonna make uh, your, your job a lot easier when you go to treat the room. Sure. Yeah. So with that, so th- that whole conversation is so pretty much just speaking about a stereo situation. So if we were to add a subwoofer to that and make it a 2.1 system, what kind of things do we need to kind of have on the radar when we're looking into doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So a subwoofer being added to the system, um, the the main thing with that is is you're you're looking for a few different things uh, when you're adding a subwoofer to a system. You're either trying to extend the low frequency range that that um, your system can can excite the room at, um, or sometimes you add a subwoofer in order to combat some of those room modes that we talked about. Like by placing the sub in certain spots, it can uh, counteract these room modes and, and create a better frequency response for your listening position. Other people are just I, I want to excite down to 20 hertz or whatever whatever frequency the target range is but it's it's also important to uh, um, uh, handle room modes and, and there's ways that you can do that um, when it comes to placing your subwoofer there's a trick that we use a lot that it seems 
you know, not uh, super scientific, but it mm -hmm. works every time. Um, and it's called the subwoofer crawl. Yep. Um, and, and you may have read some things online about this, but it, it really does work where um, you actually place the subwoofer at your mix position. And, and so uh, you take that subwoofer, set it right where your chair would be, mm -hmm. and you play some things through your system, through the speakers and the sub that have some good low frequency content that you're familiar with. And it sounds silly, but you actually get down on your hands and knees and you crawl around your room and put your ears in locations where the subwoofer could potentially go. Sure. Okay, so uh, it could be crawling around the back side of the desk or the sides there. You just move your ears throughout these different locations. And what you're going to hear is certain areas where the, the bass seems way overpowering and too boomy and bass heavy. Other times where it seems too thin and, and, and uh, uh, isn't as present. But then there's going to be spots where it's like, man, that seems really consistent and even. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing is you just put a little like, I usually put a piece of painter's tape on the ground in those locations that were good. You can then pick up that subwoofer, place it on those spots, and then you go sit in your mix position instead, and it translates. Okay, yeah. and and so what you experience there on the floor um, it can can then you can experience that in your listening position. And uh, it, like I said, it works. Uh, you know. All the time, I, I, I probably look silly in a lot of studios where I'm crawling around on the ground. Uh, sometimes I get the client to do it as well with me to be able to experience that. Yeah. Um, but it's really a great way to, to place your, your subwoofer. Because one thing is is that our recall, as far as like discerning from one sound to the next, is about seven seconds that we have uh, before we forget kind of what that sounded like to yeah. be able to compare it to something else. And if you've got a large subwoofer and you're moving it to a position and then you're walking back behind your desk and sitting back down, listening, and then making another adjustment, you're outside of that seven second window and you don't really can't really tell the difference. But if you're in real time moving throughout while crawling and, and listening, uh, you're really able to discern like, okay, this, this spot sounded better than this spot. I'm going to try that. And uh, it also saves your back from having to move the subwoofer so many times. Sure. Okay, so once you get your subwoofer placed uh, based on the subwoofer crawl or whatever method you're using, um, it's sometimes really nice to be able to set a delay if, if it's necessary because most likely uh, your subwoofer and your monitors are not going to be placed equidistant from, from your listening position. Um, and so uh, what you want to do is be able to see uh, what kind of delay in, in time, like milliseconds, that you would set on either your speakers or your subwoofer. So if your subwoofer is further away from mm -hmm. your ears, then your speakers are, uh, then you want to set a delay on your uh, monitors. Um, sure. And then if, if your monitors are further away than your subwoofer, you want to set a delay on your subwoofer. And so a way to calculate that, I have this equation pulled up on the screen where uh, you take the distance your ears are away from the subwoofer, you subtract out the distance from your ears to the monitors, and then divide that by 1.13 feet per millisecond, um, which is the speed of sound. And so okay. this gives you a result in milliseconds, and that is the delay that you would set. So in this example down here at the bottom, you're six feet away from your subwoofer and uh, five feet away from your monitors. And uh, if you do all the math to calculate that out, it ends up being um, 0.88 milliseconds is what the delay you'd want to set on your monitors so that the sound is arriving at your ears at the same time. Okay. So now that we've covered, so we basically covered a stereo setup, a 2.1 setup. So what if we have a dual or a quad setup when it comes to the subwoofers? Yeah. Um, how do you handle that? So that's something where it gets a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. and the uh, subwoofer crawl uh, isn't isn't uh, as applicable because now you have two sound sources of subwoofers rather than just one. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some rules of thumb and there's some different resources which we can uh, link in, in the description of the video here of like books that you can look at as far as subwoofer placement. But I'm sharing a screen here of, of a, a three different scenarios for a dual dual subwoofer uh, placement. And uh, these are, there's some experimentation that's going to go here. And if you can do some acoustical testing, it's going to be very beneficial. But these are setups to try to minimize um, room mode issues in your space with your subwoofer placement. Okay, sure. so it's less about it just extending the low frequency range of your system, but also using more than one sub to counter counterbalance some of these room mode issues that you have. And so on the left here, uh, we've got uh, the, the speakers in the corner. Uh, the subwoofers in the corner uh, in the, the front half of the room. 
so this is uh, imagining the the uh, speakers would be located at this green line here, where the uh, where the uh, uh, mix position is at the 38 percent point, mm -hmm. and then you have your subwoofers in the two corner. Now that's going to combat certain modes and not others, and so there's there's three different options here, so you can experiment to see what your room is going to m most benefit from. Sure. The second one here is uh, with two subwoofers having one in the uh, front of the room, right in the center of the wall, and then in the back of the room, right in the center of the wall. And then the final one here is placing them at the quarter wavelength points on the front wall. So this red line, so these red lines going front to back, represents 25% of the width of the room, and you wanna place your subwoofer right at that location at the front of the room. Now, like I said, uh, experimentation's key. I would try all these different things out. Sometimes it's gonna be just a matter of logistics in your room, like can a subwoofer go in these locations? Like for instance, the center option here, uh, in the front center of your front wall and the center of the back wall, well, if you want really want a couch on your back wall, uh, the subwoofer is not going to be able to be placed there. Um, sure. So there might be some compromises that you have to look at. Now, when it comes to quads, going to the next uh, set of diagrams here, <clears throat> these are the configurations that we usually start with if they're going to have four subwoofers in their system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one on the left here is is all four corners, have a subwoofer in all four corners. Um, we've also got the center uh, option here, which is uh, in the center of each wall. And then the last one here is at the quarter wavelength points on the front wall and the back wall. And again, uh, there's a lot of, you could spend an entire podcast just talking about the ramifications of doing this and, and where you place them and what types of modes it's going to impact. Sure. And uh, like I said, we can link some references on if you want to dig into that further or we could potentially do another ep episode uh, podcast about that. But mm -hmm. these are the places I'd start if you just want some general tips and techniques. Sure. So the natural next step would be like on a lot of projects now, a big topic of conversation is Dolby Atmos. Absolutely. Um, so what are some things that add on to that conversation then for studios that decide that they might want to go to an Atmos setup? Yeah, and this is going to be a, a topic for a complete uh, podcast where we're going to really dig into all the Dolby Atmos requirements because mm -hmm. there's a lot uh, that, that goes into this and and uh, Dolby's done a great job of, of outlining what their requirements are and limitations that you need to look out for and minimum room sizes and, and uh, angles of speakers and where they're placed. But now with, with Dolby setups, you might be looking at 11 speakers in a room rather than just the stereo setup that you, you started with. And uh, with this immersive environment that you have uh, causes some other acoustical issues as well. So we're going to really dig into that. But when it comes to speaker placement, really what you want to do is is uh, work through um, the, the guides that, that Dolby has, mm -hmm. like make sure that your side surrounds and your your rear surrounds and your height channels are all within spec um, because sure. being outside of spec, um, it, you know, doesn't mean you're not getting some sort of immersive environment, but you're not to the Dolby standard, which is what everyone's trying to shoot for. Sure. Um, and so if we look at this diagram, this is a project that we're working on currently. And uh, we've got a uh, soffit mounted speakers here in the front um, for, for kind of a main system. Uh, but then we have a Dolby Atmos system in here as well. Um, and we've got uh, left, center, and right. So we have left, center, right. And then we have our left side surrounds and left rear surrounds. And then we have our right uh, side surrounds and right rear surrounds. Um, in red circles here on this diagram, we have height channels. So you see those in these different locations. <clears throat> and all of this, uh, they, they play on each other, you know, as far as uh, like we've built a, a dynamic block in our, our CAD program that uh, allows us to be able to size this really quickly and, and make sure that we're within our Dolby standards. But this is something that you can look at guides that Dolby um, produces and be able to, to lay it out in your room. And when we're designing a studio from the ground up, we have to consider things like you can see in this, this uh, layout here is that there's a sliding glass door that uh, travels from the control room to the live room. And if this happened to fall in a place where a speaker needs to be lo located, it's going to be a tripping hazard and also uh, impair your vision of, of looking through that sliding glass door. So it's all part of the process. It's kind of like a game of Tetris, like you're just trying to fit the puzzle pieces where they need to go. And when dealing with Dolby Atmos, it, it really is kind of one thing plays on another. Sure. Um, I would say that with Dolby Atmos right now, um, if we're designing a studio from the ground up, it's always a topic of conversation. Yep. Whether or not they're doing it from the ground up, uh, like saying like, hey, day one, we're gonna have Dolby. Mm -hmm. I even if they're not planning to have it day one, we're running conduit and we're planning for, for the future in case they end up um, you know, uh, doing that down the road. And even 
thinking through things like how are speakers going to be mounted to this room after it's already constructed, you know, right. and, and so it's a, a really big topic of conversation. Really looking forward to that podcast to just dig yeah. into that because it's probably one of the biggest questions that we get. It really is. And not only like when we're asked, like doing the initial questions for a project to figure out the scope, but just in the industry right now, I mean, everyone's talking about what's happening with Dolby. So Absolutely. I'm really excited about that one as well. Well, that brings us to the end for this one. So, I mean, the biggest take- takeaways are like things about speaker positioning, things with the 38% rule. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any last thoughts that you want to add? My biggest thing is just to experiment. Besides your time, there's no investment in in just experimenting with your your placement. You know, sure. uh, you want to avoid things like setting your your mix position up in a corner or not having symmetry. You know, uh, mm-hmm. left to right. You want equal energy coming from your left and right side. You know, and uh, but I would just say spend some time, spend an afternoon setting up your speakers. Maybe if you can take some acoustical measurements, like there's some free software out there like Room EQ Wizard, and you can get an omnidirectional measurement microphone that, that uh, you're able to capture some good information and kind of look at the graphs and see like, hey, this one looks a little flatter than this one. And mm-hmm. uh, if I make this adjustment, uh, you know, this frequency range gets better, but then this other one gets worse. And you just kind of dial it in. And, and uh, the nice thing about that is that it's it's basically free. It's your time uh, involved, sure. but um, you can end up getting a much better result in your room uh, just by experimenting. Sure. Yeah. Well, great. Well, that wraps us up here. Yeah. So as yeah. always, you know, we'll be back for our next episode next week. And yeah. then if you know someone that would benefit from this, we definitely encourage people to pass this on to their audio friends because it really does make such a big difference. Yeah. And, and when we go through these podcasts, I'm sure it's going to answer a lot of questions, but it's mm-hmm. also going to generate just as many. And so if you've got questions or topics that you want to submit to us for a future episode, you can email us at info at haverstickdesigns.com. And uh, yeah, we're just really excited to kind of go through this with you guys. So thank you for being a, a part of the sound project and we'll see you next week.